Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. Okay, let's begin in prayer. Blessed is our God at all times, both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. O Lord and Master of my life, deliver me from the spirit of slothfulness, meddling, ambition, and vain talk. Bestow upon me, your servant, the spirit of purity, humility, patience, and love. Yes, O Lord and King, grant that I may be aware of my own sins, and not to judge my brother, for thou art blessed unto ages of ages. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Amen. All right, well, thank you so much. What I'm going to do, just, uh, I wanted to, uh, again, compliment Father's prayer with the prayer in union with the Immaculate Heart of Mary, since the Virgin Mary was given to John uh, to care for from the time of the cross, and also as the beloved disciple, representative of all of us. And as she gathered in the upper room at Pentecost and prayed with all the apostles and the disciples for the coming of the Holy Spirit, and since Scripture should never be read except in the same Holy Spirit in which it was written, um, I wanted to use the prayer that we used the last time. And actually, I remember it from um, the Mary Movement of Priests. It was a prayer that came from the Mary Movement of Priests, and or at least it was used there. And, and when I learned that prayer, I always thought it was very beautiful. Come, Holy Spirit, come by means of the powerful intercession of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, your well-beloved spouse. Mary, our loving mother and seat of wisdom, pray for us. So in order to bring us right back into John's gospel, I've been using John's letter and the themes that were written before his gospel to make our movement through John's gospel. And so if you would, open up again in the first letter, not the gospel, the first letter of John, chapter 5, a little reminder of that strong theme in John that is guiding us for these next several nights. We're now going to be moving from this evening, from the first Passover of Jesus' public ministry, and then next week to the second Passover of Jesus' public ministry, and then the next week, the third Passover of Jesus' ministry. And so I wanted to pick up, let's read together again, uh, first letter of John, chapter 5, verse 6, verse 6 through 8. And so John reminds us, he says, this is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not with the water only, but with the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the witness, because the Spirit is the truth. There are three witnesses, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree. And really, they're inseparable. And so this evening, I wanted to pick up on the first Passover, where we said, we're going to go into this aspect of chapters 2 through 5 of He Came by Water. And my emphasis is going to be on how he transforms water to give the Spirit, or uses signs of water in how he's going to give the Spirit. And so I wanted to remind you of the movement that approaches his activities at the first Passover. Because after his public miracle, if you turn to John chapter, John chapter 2 now, the gospel, after his first miracle, it's announced the Passover was at hand, and immediately after the discussion of the Passover, it goes to Jesus cleansing the temple. And so in order to enter into Jesus cleansing the temple, I wanted to remind you of where we left off last week before we begin reading chapter 2 and then Jesus cleansing the temple. And I want to specifically remind you that we went through the days of creation it's understood that the first day, in other words, since it begins in the beginning, that John is showing us that he is revisiting Genesis, which was only a preparation 
for everyone to understand the great mystery of a greater creation, the creation of the mystical body, the church, which is the new creation, which is the eternal and everlasting creation and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And all the six days of creation in some way in some way, our preparation for us to understand the much greater creation that Christ brings about in the new creation, which is his glorified and resurrected body, which he incorporates us into a share in. And so we went through the movement of, of the six days. And we said, since in John chapter 1, verse 29, it says the next day, and I noticed Father Hezekiah he was just discussing with you the movement through the days in chapter one. And the whole point would be that we know the first day of creation is everything that leads up to verse 29. In other words, if we have the next day, then we're moving from the first day to the next day. And so we discussed, isn't it interesting, the last time we were together, we said, isn't it interesting, number one, that we see the word light appear seven times in verses uh, 1 through 14, more specifically in verses 4 through 9, that the word light appears seven times, showing this mystery of God and covenant, and God making a new covenant through the number seven. And just as the first creation has seven days, we and, and just as the first creation in Genesis begins with God saying, let there be light, on the first day, everything is all about light. And then I talked about in John chapter 1, verse 14, what's very interesting is it says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, but in the slides and in the lecture, I made very clear the Greek word, the Greek verb, skanun, is used here. And that Greek verb literally is about pitching your tent, erecting your tent. And so when it says the word became flesh and dwelt among us, we should really understand it to be the word became flesh and pitched his tent, which implicitly means he dwelt among us. But what it's actually saying is Jesus is the true sanctuary and temple of God. That's the first proclamation. Jesus is the temple of God and taking flesh, heaven and earth are joined in him. And in that first lecture, we also discussed the structure of Mark's gospel and the, and the meaning of the transfiguration and that chiastic structure of Mark's gospel, how it is revealing through the transfiguration the full divinity of Jesus Christ. The transfiguration reveals the divinity of Jesus Christ. And what I was really trying to draw out in John chapter 1, verse 14, is that the transfiguration is in fact the reconfirmation that Jesus is the true temple, that the true temple of God is in our midst. And the only veil between the Holy of Holies and our entrance into Christ is his flesh. His flesh has become the new veil. Inside the old temple, there was a curtain. There's no longer a curtain. To enter the Holy of Holies, where God is united, heaven and earth are united in the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies is Jesus Christ. And then I went through showing how, in, in essence, all the next days of creation are related in some way to Jesus being the temple or giving us entrance into the temple. And what I'm just trying to reaffirm before we move into chapter 2 of John is this. John chapter 1, verse 14 are very clear. The word became flesh and pitched his tent. Here's the temple. How do we know it's the temple? The, the next half of the verse. We beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten Son from the Father. In other words... When God came down on Mount Sinai and formed a natural temple, and actually the lectures that we did on, on the restoration of Eden, we did those lectures, we, we talk all about this in those lectures here at the ICC. When God comes down on Mount Sinai, the glory of the Lord came down, and heaven and earth were united at the top of Mount Sinai. It was the mountain of the Lord. 
And then when Moses erected the tent that housed the Ark of the Covenant, which was kept in the Holy of Holies, the glory of the Lord came down on the tent and filled it. And it became the temple of God until Solomon built a stone temple. And upon the dedication of that temple and placing the Ark inside the Holy of Holies, the glory of the Lord came down on that temple in 1 Kings chapter 8 and filled it. All of that is being said in 1 John 14, that Jesus is the temple, and we can confirm to you we know he's the temple, because at the transfiguration, we saw the divinity that was always in Jesus be revealed. What was always in his soul came out of him. He is the temple. So notice what he's doing at the first Passover. Notice what he's doing when we arrive in John chapter 2 at him cleansing the temple. You have the true temple entering a temple that is becoming an obstacle to worshiping God in spirit and in truth. It wants to hold on to preparations instead of accepting the true realities. It's become a barrier. What did Moses and Elijah talk to Jesus about at the transfiguration according to St. Luke? When in chapter 9, we look at the transfiguration of St. Luke, it's very explicit. He spoke about the exodus. Moses and Elijah spoke to Jesus about the exodus that was to come. What ritual, what ritual brings about the exodus, freeing them ultimately to leave Egypt? What is the ritual that takes place right before they're freed? It's the Passover. And so what's very interesting is we know we've had the temple presented. We've had the transfiguration presented. We know it is Jesus' mission to lead a new Passover. In other words, he has a new mission to lead a new exodus, to not just gather the lost tribes of Israel together again, to not just gather Judah and bring it together with Israel He's also going to gather all the nations of the world from the cruel slavery of the devil and bring us all into the kingdom of God. And so there's a movement we're looking at here. We are watching the true temple, and we know he's the true priest. Why? Because at the transfiguration, the father says to him, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. That's the natural son of God. That means he is automatically the natural priest, higher than the Levitical priesthood. And in chapter one of John's gospel, on day two, when John the Baptist sees him, of course, we talked about in day two, there's a separation of the waters above and the waters below in Genesis. And you notice Jesus enters the waters below on day two in John. And from the waters above the sky, the father declares from above that this is my beloved son. Well, I want you to notice that. John the Baptist points and says, behold the Lamb of God. So what do we have? The true temple, the true priest, and the true sacrifice at the first Passover give a sign and symbol of what's to come. You're about to get replaced. But before he does that, he does a special sign at the wedding feast of Cana. Who does a special sign? at the wedding feast in Cana, the lamb that John had just pointed out. So let's read this. John chapter 2, verse 1. On the third day, there was a marriage at Cana in Galilee. And so we know this third day, as Father Hezekiah just, re just reviewed much of all of this, he was making very clear that if we move from the fourth day, which is in verse 43, the fourth day of John's presenting to us the new creation. And we know on the fourth day, it ends by discussing the angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man, which means that only happens in a temple. Again, reasserting Jesus is the true temple. It moves from three days after the fourth day, we're on the seventh day. What is the seventh day? It's the Sabbath. And the Sabbath represents what? when you're supposed to enter into God. Why would I say such a thing? Well, 
because very clearly, as we reviewed the last time in chapter 24 of Exodus, at the very ending of chapter 24, after the glory cloud has been six days sitting on the mountain, it says, on the seventh day, the Lord called out to Moses, and Moses finally goes into the cloud that was resting on Mount Sinai. Moses enters God's rest on the seventh day. In essence, we see a marriage between God and man. God is now letting man share in God, making us participants in the divine nature. And so we see all of a sudden, very interestingly, we see on what would be the seventh day, Jesus is there at a marriage in Cana in Galilee. He was invited to the marriage with his disciples. When the wine failed, the mother of Jesus said to him, now, of course, you know all the Irish jokes that we know that the wine failed because Jesus has brought all of his buddies, and so they must have been Irish because that only happens when you invite all of your Irish friends. I guess I'll spare you the Irish jokes from there. All right, so what's the significance um, that's going on here? Jesus is with all of the apostles at a wedding feast, which clearly is representative of the Sabbath. And Jesus is going to turn water into wine. But I want to ask you something. When we were together last time, when did we see the Lamb of God gathered with the apostles in another book? It was in the book of Revelation. Flip again real quickly. Take a look at chapter 21 of the book of Revelation, verse 14. This is when we were talking about the third day of the new creation. On the third day in Genesis, what does God make? Land. And on the third day of John's gospel, he names Peter Rock. I should say he names Simon Rock, showing the foundation upon which Jesus, the Lamb, will come to be our temple in Holy Communion, where he gives us the new wine. And so in John chapter 21, I pointed to verse 14, and the wall of the city, the Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, had 12 foundations, and on them the 12 names of the 12 apostles. So you have the 12 apostles, and then 10 verses later, look at verse 21. I'm sorry, verse 22 in chapter 21 of the book of Revelation. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord, God the Almighty and the Lamb. In other words, the Lamb is the temple. And what's he resting upon? The 12 apostles. In other words, apostolic succession, which brings about the body and blood of Christ, the Lamb that was slain but dies no more, who gives us entrance by receiving his body and blood into the Holy of Holies. And what do we see in chapter 2 of John? The apostles at a wedding feast with the Lamb changing water into wine. What's that mean? He is giving signs of what the new temple will do when Jesus finishes building the new temple. You see, the new temple began in the incarnation, but it's not going to become the new wineskins until he passes through death, when he finishes building it in three days. He finishes and completes the temple in three days. Destroy the temple. And in three days, I will rebuild it. And so by turning water into wine, he's showing how he's going to elevate nature into participation in the divine nature. He's going to take water and by his power, turn it into new wine. But in the scriptures, new wine is always the gift of the Holy Spirit. Somehow through water, Jesus is going to give to us the Spirit. What's chapter 3 all about? water that's going to give us the spirit, which is called baptism, which is a baptism into the death and resurrection of Christ, who becomes the new temple through his death, and who becomes the, the eternal temple through his death and resurrection, an indestructible temple not built by human hands. And so, again, how is he the lamb? Why do I see the lamb here? Well, a little bit reminder that the lamb is the one who conquered death to give the new wine. 
He's going to have to pass through death in order to give the new wine. Again, how do we see the lamb? Take a look in Revelation chapter 5. It comes time for opening the scrolls, but no one's worthy except the lion of the tribe of Judah. And what does he look like? The lion of the tribe of Judah. How does Jesus appear in heaven? Verse 6. Between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain, with seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into the world. What does the Lamb of God do? He gives us the sevenfold Holy Spirit and all the gifts of the Spirit. How and why? Because he became the new wineskins when the old wineskins were destroyed of his body. The body that shared in our humanity, which he made capable of death, and thus belongs to the old covenant, and he puts to death the old law in his flesh, in his skins, in order to become the new wineskins that are going to pour out the Holy Spirit. And so you see very clearly the statement. Again, when we see the lamb gathered at a wedding feast, it is the lamb victorious who is going to give us the new wine, which represents the Holy Spirit. Verse 12 of Revelation chapter 5, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. In other words, when we talk about the Lamb at a wedding feast, we're talking about the one who ultimately is going to give the Spirit through water and through blood, the Eucharist. The waters of baptism and the blood of the Eucharist now the means through which the Lamb pours out his sevenfold spirit. And so let's take a look at the first Passover. What does he do? Verse 13, after this sign of turning water into wine, which means Jesus has the power to elevate nature into a share in the divine nature per 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. And so verse 13, the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers at their business. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all with the sheep and oxen out of the temple and poured out all the coins of the money changers, overturned their tables, and told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. You shall not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign have you to show us for doing this? And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will rebuild it. Well, what is the significance of Jesus overturning the tables, overturning the money? The prophecies of the Messiah are going to come and purify all temple worship. The prophecies are the Messiah is going to establish the everlasting temple. Jesus is giving a prefigurement when he does this by turning over the money and sending the animals running. Guess what he stopped all day? All animal sacrifice is, as a sign, stopped for the day. Why? Because the true temple that's about to be permanently established through the death and resurrection of Christ has appeared. The true priest and the true sacrifice that replaces all of these has come. And at the first Passover, he's coming by water. He's coming by water. He's already turned water into the wine as the first of his signs that he has the authority to do this. And he's about to implement discussion of a new ritual washing that belongs to temples. That there's going to be a new ritual washing that he's going to come through water and give the spirit in chapter 3. And so... Why is he doing this? Take a look at Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6. Hebrews chapter 8. Keep one finger here, because John is well aware of the letter to the Hebrews. What is Jesus saying? He is coming, and he's going, to be, he's going to be removing this temple and rebuilding it with his own glorified body. And he's going to be replacing the rituals of the temple with greater and better and effective rituals. And so we have in the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 8, verse 6, 
the theology, but as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry which is as much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. Well, what are the promises? The sacraments. First Passover, he gives the sign, this temple will be coming to an end. The true temple has arrived, and the messianic kingdom is about to establish itself. And so we have to consider this aspect of, of how John, to some degree, when Jesus says, destroy this temple in three days, I'll rebuild it, before he starts speaking of the waters that are going to renew us and cause us to be born again from above, before he says to the woman in chapter four, the time is coming when you'll neither worship on this mountain nor in Jerusalem, because he's pointing to himself as the new mountain of the Lord, the true temple. That, the mountain of the Lord is always about the true temple, and he's pointing to himself as being the true mountain of the Lord. But Jesus has to do something to bring this about. Take a look in chapter 9 of Matthew's gospel. He says something very interesting that helps us see all the figures of water that, and wine that are occurring here. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 17, after Jesus talks about um, when Jesus is no longer with us, he talks about you don't put a new patch on an old garment because when you wash it, the new patch is going to shrink and tear away from the old garment, right? And then he says something very interesting. Verse 17, neither is new wine put into old wineskins. In other words, Jesus has come to bring the Spirit for all of us, to make us participants in the divine nature. The old law and its rituals are inadequate carriers. That law is meant only for the Hebrew people. Jesus wishes for new and simplified rituals for all people, new wineskins. And so he says, new wine, neither is new wine put into old wineskins. If it is, the skins burst, and the wine is spilled, and the skins are destroyed. New wine is put into fresh wineskins. And so both are preserved. Well, Jesus at the transfiguration, revealed the new wine, the fullness of divinity, momentarily, momentarily. The divinity, the glory that belongs to Jesus by right as the natural son of God in the flesh, he revealed the glory that his human soul already possessed. Why didn't Jesus always walk around transfigured? because he had a passable body, a body capable of dying that he accepted and took to be a member of the race of Adam, born of the Virgin Mary. He could have let the glory in his soul always shine out of him, but he chose not to. He chose a life of humility. And he chose to let his flesh become subject to the law and to become subject to death. That's what we mean by saying Jesus became sin. In other words, taking a body capable of dying means to take a body of sin. In other words, what causes death? Sin. So Jesus takes a body, and he's going to allow it to die by not letting the glory in his soul enter his flesh permanently until when? Until he brings his flesh into total obedience. We who serve our flesh have pulled ourselves out of God's will. Jesus took human flesh in order to bring the human will that belongs to human flesh to make it always abide in the divine will. That is the work of salvation. And in doing that, he is building up for all of us the new wine in the new wineskins. When Jesus dies and resurrects, all the glory that was in his soul floods his flesh, and now his flesh partakes in his glory. His flesh is in the fullness of his divinity, the fullness, as Colossians says, the fullness of the deity 
dwells bodily in Christ. In other words, the temple is under construction. All the obedience he is offering in the flesh is meriting for, for all of us, for all of us, Christ is meriting for the whole human race, the Holy Spirit that will be poured into us through his flesh. What do I mean? His flesh has become for us. In the words of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45, take a look. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. In other words, when Paul calls him a life-giving spirit, he is saying, Jesus has his body right now in heaven. It's called the glorified body. The glorified body is so filled with his divinity that it has become a source now that from his flesh and blood, he pours out into us what's in his flesh and blood in heaven, which is the fullness of divinity. And the way St. Paul describes that is by calling Jesus a life-giving spirit. He doesn't mean Jesus doesn't have his body. He's saying his body has become the source of pouring out on us the spirit. Why do you eat his flesh and drink his blood? To receive the divinity that's in him, because he's in an indestructible body. Chew it all you want, you can't hurt him. His body's resurrected. And what he's doing is communicating to you all the divinity that is in him. By making you so desire him, you want him so badly in you, you eat him. And there's no greater way of showing your desire than when you squeeze a little kid on the cheeks and say, I could eat you up. And so Jesus is making us desire him so much, we want him in us, that we consume him as the sign we want him in us. And he pours out through that flesh and blood the fullness of divinity that's in it. He has become a life-giving spirit. Now then, that means Jesus must die, chapter 3. We always focus when we read John's Gospel, chapter 3, it's always, always discussions about, oh, you know, how can I crawl back into my mother's womb? I want to point something out to you. Why does he talk about baptism? And then in talking about baptism, you know, we, we talk about him transforming the rituals, right? That he's coming now, and he's going to transform the water rituals that belong to the temple, all the bathing rituals. Jesus is going to say, but there's a new ritual to enter me, the temple. I'm going to give you a new washing. Because remember, John's Gospel, chapter 3, verse 25, take a look. A discussion arose between John disciples and a Jew over purifying. Well, this is about the baptisms that were going on. It's all about baptismal washings. So the opening of John's gospel is about a new baptismal washing when he's talking with Nicodemus. And he says, he says in verse 3, the famous words, Truly I say to you, unless one is born again, or the word can be translated from above. So there's a play on words, from above. First it's again. And then he clarifies for Nicodemus the teaching. No, you can't crawl back into your mother's womb. I'm talking about being born from above. In other words, unless one is born again, Jesus answers verse 5, truly I say to you, truly I say to you, verse 5, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So how is Jesus going to make water a carrier of the Holy Spirit? We already performed a sign for us right before this first Passover when he gives this teaching. And the sign is he can take water and by his power elevate it to share in something greater than water by his power. And Jesus is going to take the water of baptism and he's going to, and he's going to elevate it to somehow share in something that the very waters touching us cause the Holy Spirit to be infused into us. But what I think is so interesting here in this whole conversation is Jesus moves immediately from talking about water to immediately saying, verse 13, no one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. My origins, I come from above. I am the Logos who took flesh, and I bring with me all the divinity of the Godhead. Verse 14, he moves from discussion on water in the Spirit is what you must be born of, right into, and he says, verse 14, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have 
eternal life. Why does he move from discussing baptism right into talking about his death? Because he can't pour out the Spirit. He can't pour out the Spirit until his flesh is glorified. It's only in his rising from the dead and his ascension into heaven that he has become a life-giving Spirit and can pour out the Spirit. And it's in his resurrection in Matthew's Gospel where we find, we find ultimately that Jesus institutes baptism and says, at the very end in chapter 28 of Matthew's Gospel, go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So we know that's ultimately what Jesus is going to institute. But in order to pour out the Spirit, he must die. What is baptism according to St. Paul? Take a look at Colossians. Colossians chapter 2 verse 11. Well, let's start in verse 9, a reminder of how do we get the divinity that's in him. He who has become a life-giving spirit. Chapter 2 of Colossians, verse 9. For in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And you have come to fullness of life in him who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. In other words, baptism now replaces circumcision. How old were you when you were bapt when you were circumcised into the covenant of the Israelites, eight days old, which is why we also baptize infants, since baptism is a new circumcision. But look at how he describes baptism here. Yes, it's a washing, but it also is a sign of something. This new circumcision is done without hands by putting off the body of flesh in the circumcision of Christ. You were buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. So in other words, what is baptism about? What is baptism ultimately about? You believe. Why would you get baptized? You have come to believe in Jesus' love for you, that he died for you, as St. Paul says. I believe in Jesus who loved me and died for me. So you believe that Christ overcame death. You accept his death and resurrection. How do you accept his death and resurrection for you? By being baptized. So why did he talk about, after talking about baptism, chapter 3 of John, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. The temple is destroyed of his body, and he rebuilds it in three days. Remember what he said in chapter 2, what sign do you want? Destroy this temple, and I'll rebuild it in three days. So he automatically goes into his death. Why does he talk about a serpent? Well, because a serpent represents the threat of death. And what did Moses' serpent do when he threw down his staff? What did it do to the serpents when the magicians of Pharaoh threw down their staff? It swallowed it. Death swallowed death. Jesus became death to swallow death. We are baptized into his death so that he can receive all the life that's in him. Baptism becomes faith in Jesus Christ, accepting his death and resurrection, and claiming his power over death for ourselves. And so now, when we enter the waters of baptism, Christ gives the power to those waters by his baptism to communicate the life that is in him, the life-giving spirit into our souls. And so chapter three is a preparation for us to understand the speech he will give in chapter five, when he will talk about, just as the father has life in himself, so he has given the son to have life in himself and to give that life and raise others from the dead. Chapter 4. Chapter 4 is very interesting because Jesus will talk to the woman, the Samaritan woman at the well. 
And he is going to be very clear. He's going to make statements again about giving a water to us, a water by which a spring of water will well up in us to eternal life. Verse 14, take a look. Jesus says to the Samaritan woman, she says clearly, clearly that um, Jesus has made clear that she doesn't know who's speaking with her. And he says in verse 13 to the woman taking, the Samaritan woman taking water from the well, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. The water that I shall give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. In other words, I am the Messiah, and I have come, I have come to give to you what the prophecies in the Old Testament promised when the new temple comes. From the new temple will come waters that spring up. And, and purify everything. Take a look, if you would, to what Jesus is talking about in Ezekiel chapter 47. Again, it's all about Jesus is the temple replacing what the Old Testament temple could not give, true life, through faith in Jesus Christ. And so in Ezekiel chapter 47, we see that after Ezekiel describes an immense temple that could not possibly fit on the Temple Mount where the current second temple stands when Jesus was, when they're saying, oh, you can destroy this temple and rebuild it in three days, but they didn't realize Jesus was talking about his body. The dimensions of the temple that Ezekiel speaks about in, in these chapters at the end of the book of Ezekiel is so large it couldn't fit on top of that, which means it has a spiritual meaning. It's about the temple the true son of David will ultimately erect to bring about all the promises of the messianic kingdom. And in verse 47, it talks about, verse 1, that the angel brings them to the back of the temple where water was issuing from below the threshold of the temple toward the east. And it was flowing down from below the right side of the threshold of the temple, south of the altar. So somehow from underneath the temple, is flowing a spring, and the spring is so great that every thousand yards, or every thousand cubits, so measuring from the tip of your middle finger to your elbow, every thousand measurements, that the spring is creating a river that keeps getting deeper as it moves east. It goes from ankle deep to waist deep to over his head, and then it says in verse 8, this water flows toward the eastern region and goes down into the Arabah. And when it enters the stagnant waters of the sea, the water will become fresh. In other words, what is stagnant is made alive again. Life-giving waters that Jesus is promising. He's reasserting he is the temple. He is the one who provides the waters of everlasting life. But he's definitely applying to himself to being the true temple. And right after he says he's the true temple, implicitly, by turning to this description in Ezekiel of a spring that turns into a river, notice his language in John chapter 4. The water, verse, verse 14, the water that I shall give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. In other words, becoming a river inside of him, as he'll describe it in chapter 7 of John, overflowing. And right after he says this, he says, woman, verse 21. The woman says, actually, in verse 20, our fathers worshiped on this mountain, and you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. Verse 23, but the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. So how will you worship? Through the water and the blood. The waters of baptism, which are the ritual cleansing. Before you could enter a temple, you had to have a special ritual cleansing. Jesus makes us sons of of God. Jesus, by the ritual washing, makes us shares in the divine nature. He washes us to cleanse us for what? 
so we can enter the Holy of Holies. In other words, the true temple is the Holy of Holies. It is the glorified body of Jesus Christ is the Holy of Holies. When will you enter the Holy of Holies? Well, if you're baptized with, your, with, with his name written on your forehead by having, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, which writes on you the new name, making you a son. Philii, male and female, sons of God. In other words, the mountain is not a physical place. The mountain becomes wherever the Jerusalem comes down out of heaven, the holy city. When the Lamb is made present, well, when is Jesus as the Lamb of God made present? You hear it all the time at Mass. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Happy are those who are called to his feast. What feast? the wedding feast of the Lamb made present through apostolic succession. A temple that's neither on the mountain in Samaria nor the mountain in Jerusalem, but which the baptized who've been washed to receive the Holy Spirit through the waters of washing, born of water and the Spirit, are being prepared for the true temple and entrance, which Jesus is going to describe for us in chapter 6, when he comes by blood, the Eucharist. The body and blood. Look real quickly at Revelation, Revelation chapter 14. That lamb that we saw in chapter 5, that was the risen Christ who can suffer no more, the lamb who's made present on our altars every time we say, Of the bread, this is my body, and of the wine, this is my blood. We're showing body and blood separated. What are we showing? The sacrifice of the lamb. A lamb looking like it's been slain but can die no more because the body and the blood are in him in heaven, the life-giving spirit. And so it says in verse 14, Then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion, the new Jerusalem that we see in chapter 21 coming down out of heaven, stood the lamb, and with them 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. When? Was their name written on their foreheads when they were baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, who wrote it on them, making them shares in the Spirit by the waters of baptism from Jesus Christ? Jesus, who came by water and by blood, and the Spirit testifies, and these three are one. And so we see the city coming down, as I already showed you in chapter 21. The Lamb is the temple, verse 22, and he rests upon the foundation of the apostles' apostolic succession, and it is baptism that gives them entrance and citizenship to go in and out of the temple while still on earth, chapter 5. Let me simply point to this because I want to pause and take questions. Jesus, in chapter 5 of John's gospel, is pointing to the fact that he is the true Sabbath. When does he do his miracle in chapter 5? The man who is waiting at the pool, what's he waiting for? There's a, there's, a, there's a sick man, a paralyzed man, laying at the pool, and Jesus says, do you want to be healed in verse 6? And the sick man says, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is troubled. While I'm going in, another steps down before me. In other words, it was believed an angel enters the water, and through the water, healing now comes to whoever is the first to enter. It sounds a lot like what happens at baptism. The Holy Spirit enters the waters whenever someone is being baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit enters the water and infuses that person with the healing from original sin and the beginning of divine life and the receiving the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Notice the similarities here. So Jesus heals him, but when did he do it? On the Sabbath day. So if Jesus is healing on the Sabbath, he then says in verse 17, when they're upset with him, it says in verse 17, Jesus answered them and said, my father is at work, my father is working still, and I am working. And listen to how they understood Jesus. This was why the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also called God his father, making himself equal with God. They heard what he was saying. 
Why am I allowed to heal on the Sabbath? Because God is my father and he's at work. And so I'm at work. In other words, the son of man is also Lord of the Sabbath. He's making very clear what Jesus was saying in Matthew chapter 12. He's saying, he's saying that he is Lord of the Sabbath, and ultimately, you're going to have to enter him. Why? Verse 23, he's equal with the Father, so you must honor him even as you honor the Father, reconfirming he's God, per John 1.1. 1, 1. And then he makes very clear in verse 26, for as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. In other words, the Son is one in being with the Father, and He is the eternal life. The Father is eternal life. The Son is one in being with the Father. So He is eternal life, and He has the power to grant eternal life and bring us all into the true Sabbath, entrance into the Holy of Holies, the true cloud of God. I'll end with that. Father Hezekiah. Thank you, Doctor. I appreciate the beautiful uh, teaching and insights and your energy and uh, a veritable whirlwind around the scriptures. So thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Ham, hey, we're going to go to Ahmed first. Um, hello, doctor. I got a question about the wedding at Cana, where Jesus turns water to wine, and also like the uh, healing of the uh, official's son in chapter four as well. Isn't the, uh, the turning water to wine, isn't that, representing Mo Moses's first sign turning water into blood because of the killing of the uh, the Jewish or the Israelites sons um, by Pharaoh when they drawn them in Exodus 1 and then the healing of the son is also like represents the uh, the resurrectional sacrifice the 10th plague whenever uh, the God uh, killed all of the firstborn of, in, in, in Egypt, right? But the Israelites were kind of, they were also killed like in a resurrectional way. They were all sacrificed in a resurrectional way because they did the, they sacrificed the lamb, just like uh, in Isaac and Abraham. Is that, is there anything to that? Well, I, I love that you drew this out. So I think definitely um, the first sign that Moses did was he turns water to blood. And we know Jesus is turning water into new wine. And we know the new wine is ultimately the, the new wine of the Spirit that's communicated to us through the new covenant in his blood. And so it's obviously a direct connection between water, in a sense, representatively by calling it new wine, is really pointing to, uh, to blood in that sense. So I think you're really drawing out that we're showing Jesus is a prophet like unto Moses, and therefore he's fulfilling the prophecy of Deuteronomy 18.18, 18, the Lord shall raise up for you a prophet like unto myself. And that's why you're going to see in John chapter 6, after he performs the miracle of the multiplication of loaves, they will say, surely this is the prophet in reference to Deuteronomy 18.18. 18. So I think you've drawn out very well that Jesus is being presented to us as a new Moses. And again, you're drawing out to us uh, an excellent point, and that is that Jesus is giving signs showing that he's he's beginning us on an ultimate exodus, and so therefore you're bringing you're bringing out from that point of the transfiguration in John one fourteen that it's ultimately going to since he talked to Moses and Elijah about the exodus he was going to perform that you're also seeing that brought out. So I thought Ahmed, you really brought that out beautifully. That's wonderful, and everything that you said. Next question is coming in from Amy. Amy has an interesting question here. She's wondering, and I wish we had a diagram of the temple of the Old Testament, but she's wondering if, if there's anything about the Gospel of John being like physically walking through the temple. So starting in chapter one, the Lamb of God, the altar of burnt offerings, chapter two, with the water imagery being the basin where the Jews would purify, et cetera. Like, uh, uh, wow. Wow, she's got it. So she's doing that kind of... Um how the whole setup not only represents days of creation, but how the walking you that, that if we were to pay attention to these things, I don't know, I, that, that might be something there. I mean, if you're seeing that, I'd love for you to diagram it. That would be something incredibly beautiful and for you to demonstrate some of that in terms of a movement from 
from the altar to the basin to the holy place into the holy of holies and the various symbols that we do know that these speeches and miracles are taking place on f- certain festivals related to the temple. Um, my friend, Dr. Viner was reminding me of that to, 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 to um, he's always very keen because he's a liturgist. He's always very keen on pointing out and reminding that uh, these miracles are taking place in relationship to temple precincts and festivals that are uh, surrounding the temple. So that's definitely there as well. Um, I'm going to have to try to go back to this lineup of the seven signs in relationship to the feasts that they're occurring on, not just at Passover, uh, when you do go to the temple. So I do think um, it would be very, very interesting, as you were just describing, I think it really draws out um, that movement of walking us from outside the temple to inside the temple, because actually you could say the walk of the water and blood coming out of his side is showing us the inside of the temple uh, at the very ending. So, wow, that's a very incredible thought. So, great job, Amy. Nice, Amy. If you want to diagram that out, as Doctor is suggesting, go ahead and send it to us. You can share it later on in the series. Doctor, um, the question coming in um, regarding um, John chapter 1, verse 17 and 18. It says that no one, in verse 18, no one has ever seen God, the only son who is in the bosom of the father. He has made him known. Uh, but in verse 17, it, it speci- he specifically mentions Moses, who in the Old Testament is said to have seen God face to face. So maybe wonder I'll... if you could comment on that. What we're dealing with here is he didn't see God in his essence. In other words, yes, the manifestation of God in his glory, the works of God he saw. In fact, God holds whole, God puts him in the cleft of the rock and in a sense passes by. And we, and we say kind of we see the trail of God or the behind, God from behind. But when we're talking about known as seeing God, we're referring to seeing him as he is according to his own nature. And so since the logos is one in being and of the same, exact same nature, homoousios, same substance, that only he who is of the same substance of the Father, the Logos, only he has seen God as he is in himself, not just through manifestations that occurred while a voice from above the mercy seat spoke to him. Father, did you want to add anything to that? No, that's how I've, I've always heard it described. I think I've seen, seen some of the church fathers uh, talk about that, that, that Moses saw something of God, but the word of God, as you said, beholds the essence. And, uh, and so that's how I've, I've heard it before. I, think, I do think it is interesting. I've always read that passage. I think it's interesting that John says that. He, like, he, men- he specifically mentions Moses yeah. right before he says, no one has ever seen God face to face. And of course he knows he, better than we do the Old Testament text. So he's specifically bringing up Moses, who has seen God, technically seen God face to face, but he says no one has ever seen him like this one has. It, yeah. you know, he, obviously, he knows he's walking himself into a, a place where people are going to ask that question. Nice. I think, Amelia, I, you have your hand up. Do you have a question? Uh, yeah. Hi, how are you? So my family converted to Protestantism in the early 2000s. And in the last four years, I've been making my way back into the Catholic uh, doctrine, um, the only one in my family. And so I'm having a hard time and still because I'm still learning, understanding the um, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. And, you know, as a Protestant, you believe in like the the whole born again thing and you got to get baptized and you have to accept Jesus when you get older. And so how do we uh, understand that as Catholics then babies being baptized? Um, we can give it to them because God gives rights o- to parents. Parents have rights over their children. Parents exist because children cannot think and choose for themselves. And so first we begin by saying, and uh, for instance, God commanded that the Israelites enter their children into the covenant on the eighth day. Which, which we would say is a prefigurement in the sense of, of the baptism to come in the new creation. And so certainly since on the eighth day, 
a child is circumcised and therefore entered into the covenant, then parents um, can work to bring their children who cannot speak. Parents can speak for their children. You know, it's kind of like you don't you don't have to you don't have to wait for a child to decide. We we don't say to a child, um, "Do you want to go to school today?" <laughs> we say, "You're going to school today." We don't say to a child, "Do you want to eat your vegetables?" We make them eat their vegetables because it's good for them. And the most important thing is eternal life. So we give them baptism because their will can't resist it. An infant cannot say no, and therefore we raise them in the faith within the domestic church. We raise the child in the faith to develop them for the reasons why they should be worshiping God. In other words, first we bring them to the practices of worshiping God, but then we also help them eventually take what was externally given to them, something they never asked for. We have to then present to them in their catechesis reasons why this is the truth and why it's really fulfilling what they really want so that they decide to make it their own. So what is external can become internal to them. In other words, they now really want what they've always received so they don't throw it away. And the way we make someone really want what they've always already received is we make it pass through their reason. Because if it can pass through their reason and give them reasons for belief, then their will can make the personal choice that this is with their reason and it is good for them, and now they want it for themselves. And so since they didn't have to ask for it in the first place, once they develop reason, they do have to commit themselves to it or they will lose it. So it's it's not working against their freedom in any way. It's actually in perfect conformity to human freedom. And Amelia, we have a, um, a I think it was a three-part series uh, here at the Institute on sacraments of initiation. Kelsey, it is of water in the spirit, I believe. My, my brother did that. We'll link that in the post-event email. And let that. me add one other thing, Father, and that yes, is, sir. remember this. Um, when you're born in the United States, citizenship is given to you just by being born in the United States. You don't have to come out of the womb and say, I personally accept my citizenship. It's a gift. St. Paul describes baptism as giving you citizenship in heaven. So just like you don't have to ask for citizenship, it's a gift if you're born in the United States. So also baptism, a gift of citizenship into heaven, which your parents can speak for you in order for you to receive it. To you, Martin, we're going to come to you. Okay, thank you, Father. When I read the uh, John uh, chapter 4, The Woman at the Well, it always strikes me in a, in a special way that Jesus says, he doesn't say, please give me to drink, or I'm thirsty, give me to drink, or any other way. He doesn't, there's no niceties in it. He just says, give me to drink. And when I think about that, and, and I wonder if you concur with this, that, I mean, I understand why he can say that, because he's God. God can command. If he were me, I would have to say, please, because I'm not God. <laughs> but he can say, give me to drink as a command without being rude in human terms, because he's God. <laughs> Does that make any sense to you? It does. I mean, certainly that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, I'd turn on this one, actually, too, to Father Hezekiah as to what the culture was at that time of how men interacted with women. Certainly, women did, did not have an equal status um, at that time, uh, as we enjoy in the 21st century, and rightfully so. The, real, the, the proper recognition and holding up of the image and likeness of God is equally in male and in female. But certainly, I think Jesus is doing a cultural interaction as a Jew with a Samaritan and trying to, in a sense, evoke out of her a kind of response and feistiness even, I think, might be there as well. There's a lot there, too, Dr. Marital imagery um, that is at, at play, right, with the, uh, with the Samaritans and the rejoining of the uh, northern tribes with the with the the king of judea with with christ right and then all these I, i'm just thinking all, all the times in the old testament where um where uh the man and woman met at the well and started to converse there and uh i've always seen a lot of oh, that kind of marital imagery in that story well it's awesome you brought that up father because what's really neat too is notice he's at a wedding feast and then he starts talking about i'm the true i'm the true bridegroom with this woman absolutely 
you know, as, do- as Dr. Uh, Zakonik was saying earlier regarding this, uh, the, the participant that was talking about the layout of the temple, you know, it's important as you start to see themes develop for yourself in, these, in this gospel, you might notice something like that, the bridegroom, you might, uh, you might make some connections there. It's good as, uh, as, as Christians to kind of let yourself go down that path. The spirit guides us and, it's, uh, and, and you'll have a Catholic sense, okay? A Catholic sense if you're on the right track or not, if what you're learning and what you're following is in conformity with the teachings of the apostolic teachings of the church. And then that's where Bible study gets a, like a lot of fun. And, I, and you know, this has happened to me so many times, doctor, where I'm like, I have some brilliant insight and I make some amazing connection. And then the, I start reading, I'm more, I'm reading the church fathers and lo and behold, they said the same thing 2000 years ago, you know? So, uh, so I just encourage you as you're doing your reading to be marking up your Bible, highlighting your Bible, really studying it for yourself with the guidance of the church, the guidance of the church fathers, the guidance of great teachers like Dr. Sakonikis. And when you see something open up, you see a light you, to follow that. It's good. Um, and, uh, and, and be always be uh, uh, underlining and highlighting. I'll give you one example of that, by the way, and then we'll stop. We're going to be done for the night because we just finished by the, with the story of Nicodemus and, and uh, Amelia was asking about this kind of interaction, right? Notice, and, and of course, the chapter breaks are late additions to the text. So don't ever let the chapter breaks get in your way because a lot of times we get to the end of a chapter and we're like, that's the end of the story. But oftentimes the story rolls through. And so if you just... Look at verse chapter 2, verse 23. Chapter 2, verse 23 of John. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. But Jesus did not trust, or literally in the Greek, it's the same word. He did not believe himself to them because he knew all men and needed no one to bear witness of man, for he knew what was in man. Now there was a man. Do you see that? Jeez, you already know there's a problem with Nicodemus <laughs> before we even go down the story, right? And the ultimate problem is that the Pharisees refused to be baptized by John. You can make a little note in your Bible there in Luke chapter 7, verse 30. The Luke chapter 7, verse 30, it says the Pharisees refused the baptism of John. So here Nicodemus comes, of course, in the darkness, right? When, and that's very important in the Gospel of John, right? And now there's this man who comes in the darkness. And Jesus says, Nicodemus, you can't see the kingdom. You can't enter in. Why? Because he's a Pharisee, and the Pharisees had refused baptism. That's why. So anyways, when you see something like that, my mind is about the man thing. It's under like, whoa, there's a, or, or, or doctor was, was mentioning about the light seven times. I didn't know that before. Underline that. So, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then that's going to uh, allow you to really focus upon that and follow that theme then throughout the gospel. I, I remember it was Saint Saint Ambrose. He says he says he says the prologue of John. That's the the, the beginning of chapter one, verse one through. Depends on how you count it, but verse two, verse eighteen. He's like a pebble. Have you heard this, doctor? It's like a pebble in a pond, and the pebble hits the pond and it ripples every single line of the prologue. Oh, yeah. Ripples out through the entire gospel, and then each line is then developed. In, in each of the stories of the gospel, yeah? yeah? So there's just, there's so many beautiful aspects here that we can take a look at. Doctor, we're so blessed to be together tonight and to be with you. We really appreciate your time that you spent with us. God bless you all. May the blessing of the Lord and his mercy be upon you through his grace and love for mankind at all times, both now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us.